everyone and welcome to this the next um, session in our summit on the future of work um i hope you can hear me all right paddy naomi everyone's sort of smiling nodding um here is a small interesting fact which i only thought was interesting as i was preparing for this session a few minutes ago when, when we started dancing, the first song that they played at my wedding was Dolly Parton's Nine to Five. I think a, a not so subtle jibe at possibly the amount of time that I'd spent at work. Uh, so I'm particularly interested in this, like I suppose most of us, I'm interested in it socially in a broader policy sense, but also in a deep personal one. How do we change the way in work? What will the future of our own personal work look like? In this next session, in the next 45 minutes, we're particularly lucky in being joined by Naomi and Paddy to talk about the future of work in the context, if you like, of human uh, resources, human infrastructure, and we're talking about upskilling. And, I'm, and I have to confess, it's one of those words that I absolutely hate, but think is really important. So I'm going to start by asking Naomi, if I might, just by telling us, asking themselves, what is it? What are we talking about? Upskilling. Well, yeah. um, I worry mostly about the very low skilled workers because on the whole, they are, are less well equipped to um, to find the right skills for themselves. And so um, it's about helping people to transition from one role to another because uh, work is changing and um, many people are going to have multiple careers through their lives. And, uh, and actually, younger people are more comfortable with that, perhaps, than somebody my age. But all the same, being able to transition from one role to another and to acquire new skills to do that feels really important. But um, one of the things at the Institute for the Future of Work that we've been concerned about is almost the extent to which some technologies are beginning to de-skill work even further and create this enormous gap between lower skilled work and and good fulfilling better paid bet, fairer more decent conditions work and that it's actually very hard to transition from one to the other so equipping people to be able to adapt is certainly what i mean by upskilling and i know me as the co-chair of the institute for the future of work are you more focused on those people who don't have the skills to enter the workforce at a sufficient level that they're going to have a good livelihood and a good career, i.e. at the beginnings of the workforce? Or are you more worried about people who are established in their jobs, but whose jobs are disappearing as a result of automation, structural changes in the economy? Is it the lifelong learning, if you like, the mid later stages of the workforce that you're more focused on? It's a bit of everything. I mean, fundamentally, um, we're trying to improve work and working lives for everyone because we think that if uh, if everyone has access to good work, whether they're a starter or a long term employee, um, it will be good for them as an individual. But actually, it's good for businesses and it's good for society and it's good for the economy. So we actually think that if you look through uh, the lens of work, uh, holistically, you could create a, you know, a better, um, healthier, happier society and economy uh, by focusing on work. So we, we are absolutely worried about people coming into the workplace and starting out. But we, we are also very concerned about people who are established in the workforce, but whose jobs are actually insecure and how on earth they move on from there. And this, and this, no, this might be an unfair question. What, if you try to put a number on it, what's the balance of the problem, either numerical numbers of people or financial investment cost in terms of lifelong learning, upskilling of people already in the workforce, and what's the requirement of people entering it? I, I do not know that number. I mean, my instinct is that it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's, there's a huge number of people in both of those categories. And um, we certainly should crack the younger people coming into the workforce because we should be doing that for the future. But that will take that will take time to trickle through. Actually, there's a, there's a bunch of things we should be doing in education, like introducing the importance of soft skills as something that humans do really well and machines do really badly. Um, things like that should be on the curriculum. There, there are a bunch of things we absolutely should be doing 
in school, including getting the, um, the mindset of lifelong learning established there. But all of that will take time to trickle through. But there are people right now either in atrociously dehumanizing dismal work um, whose lives and well-being are being poorly affected um, and you know and that's going to continue to happen uh, even for people in you know in relatively um, middle class jobs that, that you know plenty of those are under threat too so you know this is going to affect a large chunk of society so um, I, I think we need to worry about both frankly. I, I'm going I'm to bring in Paddy Hull but I, I'd like to you know get a Continue if I might, Paddy. This may be the wrong way of slicing this particular problem, thinking about those in the workforce, those entering it. But, but indulge me if you would, just for, for a few minutes. When you look within Unilever at the upskilling of people who are already in the workforce, I, let's take a sort of arbitrary cutoff of sort of 30 plus in terms of age. What are the skills that, that are needed and what are the obstacles to reskilling, changing people's skills, giving people new jobs and experience, what tends to be the obstacle to people moving within a company even of the scale and size of you believe? Wow, James, that is a big question. A couple of questions in there, so I'll, I'll try and uh, split it up a bit as well in the answer. Um, I think for us as well, uh, similar to Naomi, we, we're seeing this uh, across the entire employee population. So I also don't really have as much of a split where I will come in on with your question around the challenges around uh, reskilling and upskilling and this kind of thing, I think we as, as Unilever see that a lot of the rhetoric actually around this has been a bit of a concern and fear angle. Uh, you know, it can be quite scary. You see headlines, the robots are coming, automation is taking jobs, this kind of thing. And I think we are trying to at least approach it with our people uh, as, a, as an opportunity actually so to try and reposition this, because we also know if everyone's coming at it from a place of, of fear, uh, that's immediately shuts down the creativity, the creative problem solving uh, that we can all do together. So we really are engaging with every single employee um, to work on what we're calling their future fit plans. Uh, and we're using that as a way to help people think about what do they really want to do in their work? What are then the different skill sets that, that they want to develop uh, in order to have a thriving career and, and um, you know, secure their livelihoods um, no matter what. So I think that's the way we're approaching it. The challenges are, I think, around this whole paradigm that we've got around that it's a, a scary thing and, and people are, uh, are increasingly scared about this rather than trying to help by being proactive and engaging with people to work together and co-create the future. We have found when we do that together with our employee reps and, and unions, we get far better outcomes than if we got head in the sand sort of thing and, and pretending this will go away. And, and when you, I, I was interested by the slide, you know, as we started, we looked at the slide of, of where the money comes from for skills, right? And, and the interesting thing is that act, the largest single pot tends to be the centralized budget of the, uh, of the companies themselves. And, and I'm quite interested in the mindset of that, Paddy. When you think about recruitment from outside the company, particularly recruitment at the very start of people's careers, obviously you're very reliant on the quality of education that the state, the country provides for Unilever employees. But by the time they get into the company and they start progressing through it, actually a lot more of that sits on your budget. So I just wonder, I know that, you know, company specific policies are inevitably tailored to the business concern, but just tell us a little about how you think now around establishment of corporate campuses, how you think about college and training sessions, how you think about future fit and, and what lessons for those of us who don't work in that business, you think are applicable to other companies, big ones and small ones. Mm -hmm. um, great. So we, um, i just take it uh, from the top. So we also do have a, a centralized budget um, that we do split out by functions, but we've actually are uh, investing a whole lot more uh, these days as well in what we call priority skills. So it's some of the skills that Naomi mentioned around the very human skills, around creativity, collaboration, critical thinking. So the, the leadership skills, as we call it, we, we've, we've put some specific investments in that space. And then we've asked each function to develop uh, an understanding around what are the future fit skills that they need in each function. So whether it's finance or HR or sales or marketing, they've each identified that. 
And then the whole idea around the future fit plan is that people look at their current skill set, compare that to the future fit skill set, and then identify which skills they want to focus in on to develop into the future. So they, they have the agency, they make those decisions. We then build their career development around that. And do we, and do we tend to, Paddy, have a good sense of what's good for us? Hmm. <laughs> good question, James. Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, so, uh, as you saw in the SenseMaker Guide, uh, we did some research that showed uh, that um, as humans, when we are asked to say how many skills we have, we tend to say on average about 11. Uh, and yet when AI deconstructs a job, it comes up with around 34 skills uh, that we have. So we very much underrepresent. And we find actually that uh, women and, and disadvantaged groups tend to underrepresent their skills even more. So this is one area where we think actually there's a good news story for AI that it can actually support uh, people's development in the area of opening up opportunities. So we see opportunities to work uh, with AI to help infer skills into people's uh, jobs so that they, they have a broader range of skills that they are aware that actually they do have. And it then creates far more opportunities to see adjacencies, so other jobs and roles that they might actually be able to move into. And this is where I talk about the opportunity space. We're really trying to show people that actually there's more opportunity than they've historically thought. We've all grown up in these sort of silos that uh, I'm a finance professional and I'm gonna go up the pipe in finance. And we have given very little thought to the other jobs and roles that are sitting just alongside that. And we're finding that when we open people's eyes to, to those kinds of opportunities, suddenly they realize, actually, I could fairly easily reskill into some of those things. And they're growing and emerging uh, areas in the business. So why not try that out? Hey, and can I, can I ask you, Paddy, when you, when you look at skills, not on a personal basis, not the way in which we started with Naomi talking about the individual opportunities for reskilling or upskilling, but on a nation by nation basis or a region by region basis, you know, I've reported on businesses long enough. You get four CEOs together in any country you like, they'll all complain about the skill shortage, right? They'll all say to you that there's a chronic problem in the education system. When, when you sit though, from the perspective you're in and look globally at, at skill shortages and strength of skills in different countries and different places, do you feel that there are good metrics to measure in the way in which you can measure, for example, AI capabilities in certain places or carbon emissions by certain sectors, do you feel as though you've got a good grip on who's got good strength in skills and who doesn't? I think there's more work to be done in this space, uh, is the short answer, James. I, the, the good news is I think there is a lot of investment going into the space, both from, from governments and tech providers. You know, I know all the learning tech providers are trying to get into the space of helping analyze where are emerging jobs and skills, where are the declining ones, how do we help people move across? So there's a huge movement towards that. Have we got it right now? I don't think so yet. So I think we are investigating and experimenting with various options across the world to see where we think uh, we can get the best value from a combination of tech, working with governments, working with our own resources to figure out the best ways and the best opportunities for our people. And, and uh, Naomi, can I just put that to you? I'm going to bring in Dominic Atkinson and, and John Drummond in a moment. But can, can I, Naomi, just go to you first? Do you feel as though, e even at the Institute for Good Work, you've, that there's there are good metrics on this, there's good data on this? Uh, I, I don't think the metrics are as good as they could be. And it's one of the things that we're trying to do at the Institute for the Future of Work. We're trying to um, do research and encourage uh, other organisations like the ONS to um, start measuring this kind of thing as well. I did want to pick up, though, on the um, company's responsibility for training, because I, I come out of industry as well. And I, I do believe that companies need to take uh, the lead on this because they know what skills are needed, even if government funding is obviously very helpful. But um, just to mention a report we've just released, the Amazonian era, um, which, you know, given that the title of this session is upskilling at scale, what we found was a kind of damning picture of de-skilling at scale, which, um, which has got me quite alarmed anyway. And so although I've had a good look at what Unilever's doing, and it looks really good, um, it looks like best practice, and I'm very impressed. But there are a lot of companies out there that are um, 
are effectively trying to reduce the skill levels um, by bringing in technology to replace either to replace humans or to kind of replace as much of the work as they can. And that's partly been a kind of knee jerk reaction to the pandemic where they've desperately needed to reduce human contact. Uh, they've needed to let people work from home or work remotely. And so I can kind of understand how it's happened. But the sort of the net result is that the sort of the skill levels are being stripped out. So, you know, kind of couple of stories from that. There's um, an example of a till worker uh, and they have a monitor monitoring on the till that, that uses a heat sensor to look at the length of the queue. And the till workers have a, you know, a metric of what the queue level needs to be. And uh, if they don't keep the queue below a certain length, then they don't get offered more shifts, they lose work. Um, and um, you know they get called in. And, and so one of the till workers was saying the reason the queue is long is because there aren't enough operators on the tills. Um, and uh, and they were told, well, the system chooses the number of operators, so it's clearly the optimal number. And, um, and you know, uh, what she found she had to do in the end was stop talking to any customers and totally focus on scanning as quickly as possible and have no interaction with the customers as a way to meet her metric. And so, you know, that seems like a kind of bad result all round. And, you know, in the Amazon warehouse, the, the engineers maintaining the machines um, not only have an app kind of logging the jobs and what they're doing, but they have a headset that monitors even their eye movements to see if they're focusing on the job or talking to colleagues. Um, and, and that creates behaviours and mental stress, that, but also just strips out the skill. A, a, an Amazon delivery driver is literally told exactly what route to take, how many seconds to spend on the doorstep. There's an alarm triggered if they stop anywhere unscheduled, which is why some of them have taken to peeing in their vans so that they don't have to stop and get out somewhere they're not supposed to be stopping. And you know, they just describe that as being, you know, they feel like a human automaton. And so, um, I, I, as you can tell, I feel strongly about this, but the, the companies are not doing their bit there. And Naomi, just to, just sorry, just to interrupt you, I do recommend people read the Amazonian era, the the report that Naomi writes, because if you take, for example, just that case study, I was struck by it too, Naomi, of Sarah, the engineer mm. who works, who has the optimization app, right, where there's, you know, you you have to keep on hitting over ninety five percent of your work optimization, uh, a frightening thought, I think, for yeah. Any yeah. The, the, the observation that the, the report makes, which I think is really insightful, is what happens over time to those people in those jobs? The, 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 the assumption is that over time, Sarah, I don't know whether she's a real Sarah or a mythical Sarah, becomes exhausted and her job is taken by a younger male colleague yeah. and, or male person. And so what that distorts into, how that distorts employment is a massive issue here, isn't it? Yeah, no, I mean, we found um, that the use of um, AI in particular in the workplace without proper thought um, it has all sorts of unexpected inequality um, impacts um, they, and it's used for recruitment, it's used for promotion and, um, and, you know, and it's often set up with good intentions, but the outcomes are quite often, you know, sort of systematic bias, um, which is pretty terrifying. And so I'm an engineer, I am very pro technology, um, but, but actually um, these are the kinds of things that if you think about it properly and you consider the human impact, you can use these, these kinds of technologies to actually kind of enrich people's work, to take the drudge stuff away, to give them the really quality um, activities uh, and you can really use it to upskill. You can use it as a way of helping people um, through to get better quality work. But because it's been done in a rush and without proper thought, I, th I you know, I think this is really damaging. I'm, I'm kind of quite upset by what we found in the report. It's much yeah. worse than I expected. And, and, and I do think it's a concern that companies need to be held to account for. And there was a massive issue here, of course, about agency, about who actually gets to decide. I am. Uh, in a in a long running argument with Waze about which is the best route to travel, and sometimes Waze is right, but sometimes I'm right, and so the question there is who ultimately is going to decide. I, I, I want to bring in uh, Dominic and John, and uh, actually, if I might, in a moment, Finola too, because uh, this question about what skills are people getting is really interesting. But Dominic, you you were making some interesting points early on about ways in which well, you're not surprised to know, a man of my age is quite interested. It's, in, in lifelong learning and uh, uh, reskilling and upskilling at this stage in your working life. So, so tell us your experience of that and how you think of it. Thanks, James. Yeah, I, I run a uh, tech social enterprise called Stay Nimble. We help people in the middle of their careers to 
change into new types of work, identify their strengths and their talents and their values and, and figure out that transition into new types of work. And of course, part of that is an, a, a skilling challenge as well, where people need to learn new things. And we, we commonly see um, barriers for individuals really in the middle of their careers who have young families and lots of commitments really being around uh, time and money, of course. I mean, there's no real surprises there. And I'm really interested in how the role of the employer uh, needs to, uh, to evolve over the course of the next um, decade in terms of figuring out the, the right mix of the things we're talking about, this kind of precision economy of getting lots of things done that are heavily measured alongside the need for actually <laughs> De developing uh, skills that the organization is going to need in the future. And we can't let the individual only be responsible for doing that in their own time and on their own dime. It has to be the case that, you know, as we look to the future of work, the future of work involves learning. And so it has to be an expectation that employers are looking really carefully at the way in which work is organized to ensure there's time and there's obviously opportunity for people to be able to learn skills. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to ask Paddy what you think about that, and Paddy, what's available? Because don't don't go anywhere. My my interest is whether or not, even now, even if you take on board, and I'm sure you agree with Dominic about that. You know, the future of work is the future of learning. If you are a you know 30, 40 something person, your career's going really well in an organisation of your size, Paddy, and say, you know what, I think I really need at this stage not to do a part time piece of education but something full-time take a year two years out how can you in any confidence know that's not going to damage your career prospects or or work for you financially so i guess i'm really asking about how do you how do we really commit at scale to education mid-career uh yeah so fantastic so i do agree with what dominic saying uh, absolutely and we've uh, been experimenting with a few different uh, employment models to try and create this space time and resource to do this kind of relearning and upskilling so we've created a model which we call you work where people no longer have a job title in unilever they work on assignments in unilever so they're still a unilever employee they still get uh, employment benefits but they choose which uh, assignments they want to work on uh, and they'll get the rate for that assignment and they also get a guaranteed monthly retainer. And we're introducing these sorts of models to try and create that sort of flexibility and security to allow people both to uh, you know, do the work that they really want to do, the meaningful work, and at the same time, create the space for reskilling and upskilling. We're also experimenting. Uh, yeah. I just to understand that. The, the upside of that sounds to me as though I get to have meaningful work, but I'm not bound to the corporation and I'm not on the career ladder. The downside of it sounds to me as though I'm jumping from project to project and I don't have, if you like, tenure. I don't have that job security. Is that a fair description of the pros and cons? Um, I wouldn't say so exactly because the one unique thing about it is you are a Unilever employee. So you're still a Unilever employee. You still have the tenure. You're not a... You're not a gig worker. You're not outside Unilever completely. So you're, you've taken on the you work employment model. But as you are, in fact, I think what we will see, and it is early days, we've only been doing it for a year, but I have a hunch that what we will see, the people who've been in you work are working on a wide variety of assignments that they never would have had the opportunity to do beforehand. So they are experiencing work in different parts of the business that they never would have before. I think they may end up having an even better network, even better experiences than some of us who are uh, nine to five. That's just a hunch though at this stage. But um, I think if we, if we work the model in the right way, we can create both those outcomes of the benefits of tenure, network, and the flexibility and security. And, and, and Dominic, just to tell me, when you, in Stay Nimble, is it called Stay Nimble, did you That's say? That's right. When you're talking to people who are mid-career, where do they sit between Paddy's version of things, where, which is actually, let's be positive and see this as an opportunity, and Naomi's version of things, which is, yeah, I'd love to take that view, but actually the reality is I've got an app that's tracking my optimization work rate at 95%, and it's grueling. We, what, what, what's the level of anxiety and concern that you see amongst people who come to you? Um, I, I would say that largely the people who join uh, and work with the coaches at Stay Nimble, um, many of them are just stuck in making decisions about what to do next. Mm. 
Um, and so, and, and some of that is exactly as, as Naomi's described as well in terms of, uh, you know, I'd love to be able to think about these things and make a change, but actually I have a number of barriers in the way and I, I'm just going to go and do the job. And if that means I'm being tracked by an app or if I'm, um, you know, behind on the checkout queue, then I'm, uh, that's, that's what I'm going to have to do. And so it's really, really difficult, A, for people to understand that help is available, um, also to recognize that, that they need some support and that, um, you know, that's, that there are other ways in which they can, they can thrive in, in their careers. And it's, it's a long process um, for, for helping people to, to build confidence in themselves and the value that they have as humans and not as just, um, you know, operatives in, in a machine, which, um, you know, obviously that's the direction we're heading away from. And I was really interested in what, what Paddy was just saying as well in terms of, you know, um, the way of learning being baked into the nature of work, which I think is the way forward. The, the challenge, of course, is that we still have a, uh, a notion of learning being in these, for example, two to three year chunks of time away from the office. And we have to really look very carefully at changing um, many of the ways in which we recognize and accredit for certain types of learning activities um, away from these, these 20th century models of recognizing learning. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, the one thing that you should feel, like certainly I feel very sunny about in all of this, is the speed at which we've changed. I mean, when we set up Tortoise, we had a fantastic argument before we got going about remote working, in which a colleague of mine said, we must not be a newsroom where everyone has to come in, and we've got to have the capacity to have remote working. And I, like some Neanderthal, said, no, we've got to all be coming in. That's the only way you create culture. Obviously, come March of last year, I had something of a 180 degree turn on that and then realized the benefits of it. But you do feel liberated by that. Um, Dominic, thank you. Thank you for showing that with us. I just want to bring my colleague Kim down. And Kim, this is possibly a point for Naomi and Paddy, but I think you and I are thinking the same things. Do you want to tell people about the Responsibility 100 and why this question about how you rank companies and skills is important to us. Yeah, um, yeah. so for background, um, Tortoise makes this index where we rank the FTSE 100 on sort of all sorts of social environmental measures. But one of the things we really look at is we look at skills and the way that, so one of the pillars of the index is skills. And we look at sort of, we look at things like how many apprentices a company has, and how many graduates a company has and and how many um, hours of training they report per employee in their sort of annual report. Um, but I suppose I was really struck by um, I was really struck by what Dom said, which was that there really has to be a role, a sort of a role for the employer in, you know, it, it shouldn't all be on the employee to like sort out their own skills. There has to be this built in um, role for the employer and, and sort of what we do with the R100 is we, we, we seek to hold companies to account on this sort of, on this sort of area, but we do, it is a tricky thing, I think, to, to find really good metrics to, to track on companies to really measure how, how well they're treating their, you know, how, how much of a, how many opportunities for learning they are giving their employees. So I'd be really interested to hear um, from you guys, sort of what, you know, what, what metrics you think could work in terms of, you know, look, if you look at a company and something we could track um, just for, yeah, to, to, just to sort of measure how, how, well, how well companies are um, providing opportunities for learning. Paddy, Paddy, Paddy will, you, will you have a go at that? Yeah, I'll uh, try and, I, I do want to introduce one thought into this and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a metric. But one of the things that, that's been, you know, pivotal to Unilever's approach has been this focus on helping people discover their purpose and, and passions. And I mentioned it in, in an earlier session, but just wanted to emphasize it again. We think, and this is this whole thing of coming from this area of opportunity rather than fear. If we're helping people discover their purpose and, and passions in, in life and where they do want to, where, where they do have an interest and then invest in their skills in that way, then business and people are, are both going to benefit. And just one quick example, we had uh, a lady who went through this future fit planning process and she came to us and said she would really like to um, do dog training. 
uh, and we were quite surprised that it didn't quite fit with the job and that sort of thing. But she, we then realized her passion was really around uh, her dogs and she'd been to dog shows and shown her dogs and she wanted to now set up a new business to, to start dog training. And so we've, we've helped support that. And, and she's also doing you know, some of the U-Work models. So she's still doing work with Unilever. But this is where that whole purpose piece comes in so importantly because people do have more agency you know, when they're coming from that kind of space and they're having a far better, more robust career discussion. So Kim, to your point, I think there is this kind of um, intrinsic piece that is quite hard to measure, but is what are companies doing to create this environment for continuous learning and, and to help people move along this? We feel it's you know, coming from purpose, we see people's intrinsic motivations gone up 49% when they go through these workshops. And I do think that's a bit that's missing. There's a lot of focus on these metrics on how many grads and da 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 da. But what about that environment and the, the cultural piece? And what do people feel about their career development opportunities, that kind of thing? But Paddy, I guess I'm interested. I'm interested in exactly the same point as Kim is, partly because, you know, the way we thought the things have taught us was we would have conversations like this that would drive our journalism, but they wouldn't just be discussions in themselves. Our thinkings weren't just a, a kind of event in themselves, but they'd drive our journalism. And listening to this conversation, or specifically the two of you, you and Naomi, I'm really struck by the possibility that there's something constructive that you could do that comes out of this, that tries to get a better handle on what, not just budgets and time, but a meaningful measure of what the commitments that companies are making to the skills developments of their of their employees, and the reason that the reason I think honestly that that feels like a really good and worthwhile endeavour is that it's what I'd think of as the yeah 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 problem that you know someone like you oversees HR, people inside the company go yeah 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 I know that they're kind of committed in theory, but how do I know that Unilever by comparison with other businesses is really committed in practice? And so I, it seems to me that so there is something really valuable there in trying to pursue how you would get metrics that, are, that, that you personally feel like are a proper reflection of the way in which the company operates. No, I agree, James. I think, uh, and especially given the importance of continuous learning and reskilling and upskilling and all of that right now, I think Dom, Dominic made an excellent point in your, yourself as well. There needs to be a shift in the way companies are both allocating resources, but also time and, and thinking around this. And it can't all be on the individual themselves to go off and, and train separately in night school and, and this sort of thing. How are we baking it much more into the way we work? How much are we providing... Every most companies have got this EAP employee assistance programs, you know, when you, you're going through tough times. But how much are we investing in a kind of always on career support? Yes. Um, because potentially that's where we should be focusing um, our attention more and more as we're seeing this growing skills gap and these things happening. So, yeah, yeah I think uh, we as you know, would fully support that. We do report quite a bit in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. They do a bit of tracking uh, on this, and um, we, we put in some of our metrics and things there and some of our key programs. Well, There's like, probably more. And, and I think the interesting thing is this is like the whole ESG debate, isn't it? The environment, social, and governance debate, which is now we started measuring bits and bobs of everything. The question is whether or not our measurements are very good at all and whether they drive good behaviors or perverse ones. So um, let, let me, we, we've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole. Not the first time this happened, but forgive me for, for, for taking us there. Let, let me see if, if I, I'd like to just uh, bring a, a few others. I, I should say that I would note in the chat, Naomi Hewitt's point about the measure of internal mobility in the company. That's a really smart observation, strikes me. Um, uh, Fanula O'Connor, you've uh, um, had a point about the education that's provided to people entering the workforce. I wanted to hear from you, and I'm going to come to John Drum and Tree Elvin in a moment. Yeah, I think it's not just about education entering the workforce, but education, when we think about skills, you know, too often we think about just, say, academic skills or technical knowledge skills. And actually, what really is differentiating, I'm not saying anything that anyone on this on, on the panel or probably in the audience doesn't know, it's that combination of soft skills, thinking skill, problem solving skills, expert knowledge. But I think I, you know, the question I really wanted to put to the panel is, is it safe to just leave this as the responsibility of companies? Because, you know, no company is offering anyone a job for life right now. 
if your skills might be recognized in Unilever, how are they going to be skills that you can actually take and demonstrate elsewhere? Because right now, the only way to demonstrate it is actually through that kind of social capital and connections. And, you know, that's leaving out a lot of the workforce. So what's the panel think about the transferability of skills, recognizing you know, that full range of skills um, and who should actually be responsible for this and running this? Before I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that to Naomi in a moment, but can I just hear from John and Tree first? Uh, John Drummond. Uh, yeah, just a quick thought on um, that the question of metrics uh, first, if I may. Um, I'm interested that the I think the conversation needs to be as much about mindsets as it is about skill sets, and I wonder whether comparative metrics are the driver of uh, corporate behavior. Uh, uh, I got, I've got issues with that. Um, I think a couple of the metrics, for example, there is some very interesting thinking about uh, linking this to the last session on productivity. Um, there's some very interesting thinking by an MIT professor called Alex Pentland uh, around what he calls social physics, where the two key measures he's identified uh, of increasing productivity uh, is the number of social con real world social contacts you have and the diversity of ideas to which you're exposed. So those are two measures that are going to be difficult for organizations to track, and yet they're incredibly sorry, important. Sorry, 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 I'll make a second. So, sorry, the, the, the two measures are what exactly? The number of real world social contacts that you have. So th this is a good <laughs> argument why a part of your working week also needs to be in the workplace, actually having face-to-face -face contact with colleagues. Okay. Right? A part of it. Um, and it actually doesn't matter the content of the conversation. You could be talking about a fabulous series you've just watched on Netflix. Uh, it's about the actual fact of the conversation taking place at all. And the second measure is the diversity of ideas you're exposed to. So basically, this tortoise as a platform is a form of learning. <clears throat> but that's how do you measure that? that? that, that you're, 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 getting into, you're getting into very intimate matters here, John, because my co-founder, Katie Vanek-Smith, I keep saying, oh, yeah, we're a slow newsroom. She said, we're not really. We're really about understanding together. So at some point we'll figure out we'll resolve what that's what that what yeah. that's about. But but John, you, you, so, so sorry, just to complete though your point. Your point is that this is a lot of the skills responsibilities for companies are about that exposure to people and that exposure to diversity of ideas. Uh, yeah, but I I I have a I have a wider question for colleagues. I have an observation that uh, there are a variety of different forms. This this idea that somehow learning is provided by the organization is really patriarchal. Uh, and actually there's a variety of other forms of learning. Uh, for example, uh, Google, 75% of their learning is delivered Googler to Googler on topics that individuals are passionate about. <clears throat> so peer to peer learning. Mm -hmm. I think there's something dramatically powerful about social learning. I think one of the reasons why our school systems and academic systems are uh, less effective than they might be as they focus on individual learning. Uh, and I'm interested in what SpaceX are doing uh, for uh, eight to 14 year olds in terms of having them work collaboratively on real world projects. I think that kind of social learning is much more powerful than individual learning. And the third thing is that I think there are methods of informal learning that are extraordinarily powerful. Uh, there was a comment earlier in the first session today by a guy called Jonathan Booth, who said experience of work, uh, experience outside of work can contribute to innovative ideas in work. And I think that's absolutely right. So informally, tuning into uh, everything from TED Talks to uh, to uh, YouTube videos, to what, uh, whatever, uh, is actually directly contributing to mindsets and skill sets. 
so there are different forms of learning. But for what it's for what it's worth, when I worked at the BBC, I tried to make the argument that the BBC itself should do more in terms of adult, you know, lifelong learning, and the idea of trying to create a marketplace of what I thought of as BBC credits, where if you attended a certain course, if you listened to a, you know, followed mm. through a certain series of, you know, programs and discussions, you would have been, you know, informally educated around a particular subject. Um, uh, Anyway, it was the beginnings of a conversation there, but I think there really is something there around how do we attribute the learning that we've got that's not necessarily in a formal place of place of education. Um, but John, thank you. I, I just wanted to, before I go back to Naomi and, and Paddy, um, hear from Tree, if I might. Tree Elvin. Hi. Um, hi there. Yeah, just adding to John's point there, I'd say, yeah, get, get the pubs open. <laughs> Again, talk about inform. I'm not. I'm not being that facetious. I mean, talk about informal learning. It's the end of the working day. We, I don't know about the rest of us, but I think you know many of us have learned a lot from that. Just seeing how people interact and talk things through outside the workplace. But you know, a lot to be learned there. Anyway, um, yeah. So my point, I suppose, was really around. Oh, my point. You know, my my thought was around. If we're looking towards more of a, and I hope we are, a rehumanization alongside the benefits of of tech or whatever. It seems like there might be a, a more of a coming together of, of work and life skills, attitudes, values, and endeavors, hopefully. Um, with just with regard to metrics, I would say happiness, enthusiasm, very undervalued. So my, my point really was about the legal aspect. If we're all having to work together and, and everything's for the healthiest option should be moving forward more or less together, people upskilling, individual communal efforts, blah, blah, blah. Um, what about the legal one? So I'm, my, I was just wondering you, about sorry, whether- sorry, sorry, Tree, what do you mean about the legal one? The legal one. So for example, if you've got job seekers, what uh, are they aware of their, their rights and do they have any? So for example, are yeah. Amazon workers obliged to have the, the equivalent of like a, an ankle tag? Right. Are they, are they obliged to? How inhumane is this? I would strongly protest against that. Do they feel they have no choices? And do they in fact have no choices? What's the legal system doing? And can they be penalised with things like DWP um, sanctions and stuff like that? Okay. Tree, thank you very much. I particularly want to enjoy the fact that John Drummond has picked up on your Scots foreign jokes in the background. He's loving them. They're, all they're doing for me is making me feel guilty about the unhealthiness of my breakfast. But there you are. Thank you for that. It's a, it's a helpful, helpful reminder. Can I, can I start, Naomi, by taking Tree's point, this, this, this last point? She's making a point about what rights and protections do we need in a, in a new age for workers. And I don't know whether you saw in the chat there was a really seemed to me a really good question about what company what rights do companies have to provide to, to operate these observational and monitoring tools so will you just address that first yeah so i think it's a really great question tree and we we've looked at that a fair bit we've especially looked at it in the context of um using ai for uh, decisions that materially affect workers lives and um, you know, there's a bunch of things like the existing Equalities Act, which actually it gets applied to how humans treat each other, but it doesn't seem to be being applied to how AI treats humans. So there's existing legislation that just isn't being used, but probably could help us. But we certainly think that there needs to be new legislation to kind of react to this, you know, kind of a new employment bill, which perhaps includes digital rights. Um, things like um, accountability for algorithms, um, uh, in mandatory disclosure of the purpose that algorithms are being used for and things like that. So um, I do think that there's a, there's a hole in the law and some new legislation is needed. And also there's existing laws that's not being applied because it's machines doing it, not people. And so um, it is an area that I think you're right um, to highlight. And, and while I've got the stage, I'll just mention in response to what John said that um, one of the interesting things we found in our report, when you talk about kind of metrics and, and what we should be measuring, is that the, the introduction of technology, or well, rather the lazy introduction of technology without properly thinking about it, has resulted in things being measured that are easy to measure, like the 95% work rate or like where you physically are, and actually the stuff like the human contact and, and the, you know, the informal learning is hard to measure. And so that's getting lost along the way. And so actually, 
um, at the moment, the introduction of tech is part of that problem that, that things are being measured in a really simplistic way. And again, we think we, we could do better, but it needs to be thought about properly. In, Naomi, thank you. Um, as ever, we've had so much to talk about and we're left with one minute to deal with the impossible interlocking issue, Paddy, of, you know, Finula's point, which is, you know, who should be paying, how much should sit corporately and how much should sit socially in the government. And John's point about how do we think about this, not just in formal ways, but in new and less patriarchal ways, but in peer-to-peer -peer ways and informal learning. How do you think about those things? Well, I think at, at the end of the day, it's always this combination approach. Um, you know, there is the the individual who um, I think, uh, and I think this relates to John's point, the organization plays a role of creating that enabling environment for the continuous learning, whether it's the social learning, whether it's formal, that sort of thing. Organizations can definitely play a, a big role in doing that. Then there's the individual with the motivation to go after it. And that's where I think purpose and, and helping people have agency in it is so important. Again, organizations can play a role there. And then from governments, again, it's always this enabling framework that makes, you know, new ideas and new creative ways of, of doing things help. So, you know, the whole idea around how do we help people have the time and the resources to study without having to leave a job and will still be secure and, and this kind of thing. We need more, more work in that space. Um, there's some tentative moves being made, but I do think uh, a lot more can be done there as well. Paddy, thank you. Well, listen, a, a huge thank you to you and to Naomi. As ever, just as you get the end of it, you go, right, well, now we're really getting going. Now we're going to try and re-engineer the patriarchal system of learning in companies. We're going to, you know, bring in measures we haven't thought about. You know, I love Tree's point about, well, how do you measure happiness and enthusiasm? That is a metric we haven't thought of. Uh, I won't try and summarise what we discussed, but I will say two things that we'll take away for us in terms of how we actually digest what we've listened to and learned in the last 45 minutes. I do think that Kim Dower and I will take forward the question about, are we measuring the uh, investments in skills helpfully? Not just accurately, but helpfully. I think that's a really good question. And I am really sort of prodded by John Drummond's point about the extent to which you really make peer-to-peer -peer learning. I suppose that's what the point that Dominic was making too, is how do you actually enable people? I guess your point too, Paddy, it's that point of passion, this point of purpose that people come together and actually exchanging what they know, what they care about. So I will make sure that we think it talks a little bit about how we in our thinking themselves can enable the sharing of more information. That itself would be a really useful thing. And I hope that in the pursuit of this issue, we'll be, you know, radically optimistic. We'll look for the for the good potential here without being blind only to the points you're making about the real challenges people are facing in the, in the technology and automation of work. So thank you all for joining us. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Liz Mosley. Um, I have to say, I come down on one side on the coming argument, the office is dead, long live the office, um, uh, which is uh, both sides. Uh, I'm loving actually being back in the office and rather relish a new life that I've ever had. Uh, before working from home. But I'm imagining that uh, Liz is going to address this in a little more insightful detail. Paddy, Naomi, thanks very much. Uh, Liz, over to you.